In that clip you just saw, you may have seen a rather short man wearing a fez who was shaking the hands of a big uh, white man. That was Sultan Jamal Jamalul Kirang II, the last Sultan of Sulu, who died in 1936. Now, this film dates from 1933 and shows him expressing support for Philippine independence to U.S. Senator Harry Hawes. That was the white man. Now, before I go on, I'd like to welcome members of UP's uh, Muslim Students Association. Thanks for coming, and we'd like to get their views on this issue later on. Now, of course, the old sultanate is long gone, but its memory lives on and uh, in that its territory, along with the territories of other historic sultanates, such as Maguindanao's, constitutes the extent of what modern-day Filipino Muslims call their ancestral domain. I'd like to show you some maps I dug up from the Perry Castaneda Historical Map Collection featured in the University of Texas at Austin website. Now, they date back to the final decades of the Spanish era at the time of the formation of the Philippines as we know it today. Now, what we're showing you are details. The whole maps are going to be available on our blog. So first, here's a map which shows the division of our part of the world among the various colonial powers. Now, if you zero into the part we reproduced here, Notice how part of what we consider today's uh, Philippines was shown to be outside direct Spanish control. You'll also notice something we pointed out previously on this show, how the Spanish view of the Philippines stretched to present-day Guam. Now, here's another German map, which also dates back to 1859, which gives you a clearer view of the fullest extent of Spanish direct control over, the, over Mindanao and Palawan and the territory formerly recognized by other nations as being outside the direct control of Spain. That's this dotted line that goes here, if you see it. There, that is the division line. Now, this other map we're going to show you from an American encyclopedia circa 1892, practically the eve of our own revolution, and then uh, the Filipino-American War that followed, shows the territorial extent of the Sultanate of Sulu here in yellow. See here in uh, Mindanao and part of Palawan. Now that yellow area more or less is the claimed ancestral domain that the MILF got our president to recognize two weeks ago. Now with this historic area in mind, the historical basis of the territory, territorial claims of the MILF are clearer to us. Now, if today we have the ARMM, the Autonomous Region of Muslim Mindanao, that was born of the Tripoli Agreement signed by President Marcos with the MNLF, and if we refer to those old maps and refer in turn to the details of the memorandum of agreement the President wants to sign with the MILF, which includes this map, by the way, uh, which lists several hundred barangays that would be subject to a plebiscite on their proposed incorporation into the Bangsamoro juridical entity, then we get the expansion of the ARMM from this, as you can see here, this is the present day uh, ARMM, to this, the next image, which shows the plebiscite areas for potential inclusion in the BJE, and it all falls neatly into place. But then, of course, one problem is that the MILF began as a splinter organization from the MNLF. And the MNLF in turn had its origins not in the old Muslim royalty, but among intellectuals who would have had no prominence in the old royal society that's governed Filipino Muslim society for centuries. Four things happened to this ancient sultanate, the Sultanate of Sulu, which dated back to 1450 AD. First, between 1877 and 1883, it became a protectorate of Spain. Second, when President Aguinaldo sent feelers to the Sultan for his dominion to join the First Republic, the Sultan declined. Third, between 1899 and 1896, the Sultanate of Sulu became a protectorate and then an outright conquered territory of the United States with American officers such as Leonard Wood and John Pershing gaining fame for their conquests, often quite bloody. Now, the United States finally obtained treaty concessions in which the Sultan lost all his remaining political powers. Until 1935, though, American governors general personally appointed senators to represent the Muslims in the Philippine government. And Muslims, like Christian Filipinos, entered the colonial army to help enforce American control. Now, the fourth aspect is that in 1935, Muslims then participated in the drafting of the Philippine Constitution and the territory of the old Sultanate participated in the plebiscite that ratified that Constitution. And in 1936, as we learned earlier, the last Sultan of Sulu died. 
And when the Philippine government refused to recognize a successor, the heirs of the last sultan proved unable to select a successor, a problem that exists to this day. Now, Christian leaders, as shown in this photograph from the, from the late 1920s, pursued a two-track policy of trying to build alliances with Muslim leaders, while in areas outside the traditional domains of the old sultanates, the commonwealth that followed was concerned over neighboring powers, including Japan, simply annexing Philippine territory before we could even become fully independent. And so began the policy of encouraging settlers from the Visayas and Luzon to move in to Mindanao. This is why you have a city named after this gentleman we'll be showing you here in the middle, uh, former Philippine Army Chief of Staff Paulino Santos, shown in the center of this photograph, and after whom the new settlement he supervised is named, Gen San. Now, by the 1960s, however, the new generation of educated Muslim non-royals had had enough of the old Muslim royalty who'd become senators and congressmen and sometimes governors, and instead of dreaming of sultanates, they, they aspired to modernity and even independence. Now, in the 1990s, of course, a further change took place, a less, a less secular one, a more fundamentalist one, where being Islamic was more important than perhaps being merely moral. So where are we now with these old claims mixed with new ideologies? We'll talk to someone with opinions on this matter when we return. Books featured by The Explainer are available on shelves or on order at a different bookstore. Well, speaking of books, we have one book to recommend to you, Thomas McKenna's Muslim Rulers and Rebels, which helps explain the dynamics of rebellion among the Muslims in Mindanao and uh, the dynamics between ordinary Muslims and their royalty and leaders. Now, today we have with us political analyst and executive director of the Institute for Political and Economic Reforms, Monica Siple. Mon, I wanted to start with something I raised at the beginning, which is that there seems to be a difference between the timeline the president was referring to, that she signed an agreement with the MILF uh, the eve be evening before her sona, and the public statements of the MILF that they actually signed an agreement with the government on July 16. That's a gap of over 10 days. Well, what accounts for this? Well, the story here I heard was that there was already an agreement on July 16, but uh, there was the threat of a walkout by the MILF because of the uh, ERMM elections. And uh, that produced basically the pressure that we, we saw on Congress to pass a law to postpone the elections. And uh, I think there was a problem there when government told the MILF that it cannot be done. For lack of material time for the yes. postponement. Now, why would the MILF be so insistent on not having uh, the elections going through in, in the ARMM? Well, they would be interested in postponing it precisely because the ones who are running for elections are within the context of ARMM are basically political enemies. Uh, for example, Governor Rampatuan has a long-standing uh, conflict with the MILF in Cotabato provinces. Now, th this is something I'd like to ask our audience to weigh in if, if they have an opinion also and, and ask you, Mon. We, it was sort of to be expected that uh, Christian Filipinos in, in, in the vicinity of the, of the area, especially the ones that might be uh, included in a plebiscite, would be upset over this agreement. But it's very interesting that there have been Muslim voices also raised uh, against this uh, agreement. One, one argument that, that you see in the papers is that there are some Muslims who object to the MILF speaking for the entire uh, Muslim community. Now, is this a, a genuine dynamic to be to be concerned about or just a sour graping on the part of those who weren't able to clinch a, a deal? Well, I think uh, there is some uh, truth to it, that uh, there really is, uh, is a conflict within. Because remember, MNLF was the first one who had an mm. agreement in the Jakarta Agreement. And they were never part of this present uh, uh, peace talks with the MILF. And ARMM was the product of an MNLF initiative.